And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague and our MSNBC chief legal analyst and host of The Beat, Ari Melber. Ari, take it away. Thank you, Joy. Uh, great to be with Joy Reid and everyone here as we cover what has really been a striking resolution to a trial that's captivated much of the country. Uh, as mentioned, we have our uh, guest reporters, experts with us. Katie Fang, your reaction to what we just saw in the verdict? I was startled by the fact that there was almost little to no reaction from Alec Murdoch, his son, Buster Murdoch, who was located a few rows behind them. I reasonably anticipate, Ari, that the judge in this case, who, by the way, his name is Clifton Newman, he's done an exceptional job of running a tight ship through weeks of testimony evidence and, frankly, a lot of very strong emotions in that courtroom. I reasonably anticipate that he will sentence Alec Murdoch to life in prison with a 30-year minimum mandatory. But it is kind of remarkable that the verdict came back so quickly after weeks of testimony being presented, after all the evidence that was presented in this case. But it clearly showed that the jury rejected any defense that was offered by Alec Murdoch, including the two days of direct cross and redirect that Alec Murdoch went through in his own defense. I thought as a former prosecutor, it was a huge mistake for him to take the stand. And it looks like the jury agreed that at the end of the day, Alec Murdoch lied and that he was a habitual liar and that he lied to be able to get himself out of the guilty verdict that he just had rendered. Yeah, striking to see a guilty uh, verdict, a conviction here of, of Mr. Murdoch uh, for double murder. We're looking at some images of his family. And, and Ellison Barber, uh, some viewers and some people around the nation have heard about this case. It's a uh, truly uh, scandalous set of facts now as a convicted double murder. Um, there are uh, various shows, Netflix and, and others, that have signed on to tell the story. It's really in an era when we don't have many, quote unquote, national trials. This would seem for some Americans to be one. Uh, but for those who haven't been following it as closely, could you tell us, Ellison, a little bit uh, about what led to tonight's verdict and this family um, that is multiple generations of legal uh, DA legal royalty, really, the establishment in this state. Uh, his father, grandfather, and others were DA. Now he stands convicted tonight uh, as a murderer. Yeah, I mean, if you were in that courtroom tonight, sitting where the judge is sitting, and you were looking directly ahead at the door, to the left of that door, there is a wall that is empty, and it is empty because a photograph of the defendant's grandfather was previously in that space, because for generations, they have been solicitor generals here. They are a well-known family uh, in this part of South Carolina. They have a well-known reputation in the legal community and also just amongst people throughout the low country in South Carolina. So look, the prosecution, they did not have a lot of direct evidence in this case. The two murder weapons they say were used, a 12-gauge shotgun and then a 300 blackout rifle, those were never found. But they relied on uh, markings, tool markings on the shell casings that were left around Maggie Murdoch's body. And they had experts testifying that those same tool markings were found on bullets that were fired on this hunting property over 1,700 acres long before the murder. And that was really where they tried to uh, tie this idea that these were family weapons uh, to the case. Really, the key piece of evidence that came into this case kind of late was a Snapchat video that was taken by one of the victims, Paul Murdoch, minutes before the state said he died. They based his time of death on the time that he stopped using his phone eight 49, June 7th, 2021. That Snapchat video that he'd taken but never sent, it was recorded five minutes before that. And in it, he was taking a video of a dog and you heard two voices in the back that Alec Murdoch admitted on the stand that was his voice and his now deceased wife, Maggie's voice. That was huge because for months, 20 plus months, Alec Murdoch had maintained that he was not at the kennels during the time that they were murdered, that he had not gone back there until he discovered their bodies uh, lying on the ground. So for the first time when he took the stand, he admitted to a lie. And the prosecution said you lied about what is probably the most important fact of all, that you were with the victims at the scene of the crime minutes before they were murdered. The prosecution really centered a lot of their case around this idea of a motive. They talked a lot in their closing remarks about this idea of a gathering storm. And already there were really three parts to that. They say one part was the fact that Alec Murdoch had stolen legal fees 
documents from his law firm in a civil case that he had worked on. And people he worked with had noticed legal fees were missing, and they were starting to ask questions. They were starting to investigate him. He knew that he had stolen millions of dollars from his legal firm, his legal clients over the years. And with that investigation, they say he started to panic because he was worried all of the other crimes were going to come to light. The second part of that, quote unquote, gathering storm that the prosecution talked so much about was a 2019 boat crash where the late Paul Murdoch, his son, was accused of driving a boat that crashed and he was accused of being under the influence at the time and killed a 19 year old named Mallory Beach. Alec Murdoch owned that boat and he was named in a multi million dollar civil lawsuit. That's factor two. They said factor three of this quote unquote gathering storm was the fact that Alec Murdoch's dad, who he trusted so much, cared so much about, was dying. They said Alec Murdoch was someone who didn't want to be shamed because his legacy, his family name, was so important to him and that he felt so much pressure from those three factors, that gathering storm, that he thought his only way out was to kill his wife and child. They say his life was like a Ponzi scheme. Anytime something started to happen, he found out a way to become the victim, to shift attention, and then maneuver things around to cover up his wrongdoings. This time, they say, it didn't work. He got caught. He went before a jury, and a jury found him guilty.